and welcome everyone to Your Best Life. Uh, this is the first one in our series of Jack Cunio today from Kindness Yoga. This is the first one we've done for business specifically. Uh, so Your Best Life is, a, is an ongoing video blog uh, where you can learn strategies to live your best life, actionable strategies uh, that you can put into place every day. And um, I just felt like there's so many of us that are in business that want to serve others. Uh, so we're serving. Um, if everyone could please share, uh, that would be great. So go ahead and mute. And um, in a minute, we'll all introduce ourselves and we'll ask you to unmute. Um, so Jack uh, Cunio, who we have on the line today for the, the first business version of Your Best Life, is, is into marketing, product development, and an information professional. Um, he's an expert in the Lojas industry, which if you're not familiar with, is lifestyles of health and sustainability. And every day he strives to deliver value, inspiration, and fun in all of his relationships. And, um, Jack, most importantly, I think, and currently is the marketing director for Kindness Yoga, I believe he can tell us more clearly about this. He got on board with three locations, and now they're ready to go to their seventh location. Uh, pretty cool here. And uh, let's all mute, please, if you haven't yet. Hang on one second, Eric. I'll be right back. You can keep going. Okay, thanks. We're getting a crazy sound. Uh -huh. I'm just looking for the mute button here. Hey, sorry about that, Eric. I'm back. Jack. All right. So everyone's muted now. I think we should have a better signal here. Um, now, I, I set it up so we could um, unmute yourselves. Uh, but before we go around and, and tell us who we are and what company we're with, um, actually, let's do that. Let's do that. Let's go around and, and uh, go ahead and unmute each, each person. And let's start off with Darren. Um, go ahead, Darren. Tell us your full name and, and what company you're from. Can you hear us, Darren? Or whoever, whoever can unmute their own sound, go ahead and go first. Just jump right in. We want to know your name and um, the company you're from. Let's see. Let's start with Heather Lindemann. Heather, can you go ahead? Hello. Jack, are you able to hear me? Okay, I'm going to hit un. <laughs> Maybe we'll start this again. <laughs> um, okay. I'm unmuted. Okay, now can someone introduce themselves? Yeah, can you hear me? It's Darren. Yes, thank you, Darren. Go ahead. Oh, great. Great. So my name is Darren Zier. I live in Denver, like I guess all of us. And um, an area that I'm wanting to focus on today is what I call my office yoga business. It's, I have a book called Office Yoga, and it's something I've done nationally, but I've never done it locally or not much. Um, I have a website, I have a flyer, and I just really want to kind of, you know, in the studios, I feel like we're almost preaching to the choir but it, when I go to a company, it, you know, people are pretty banged up from stress and sitting at their desk. And I just want to get out there and help people in those situations. Thanks, Darren. So getting out there into the world and helping people, uh, not just in the yoga studios, where a lot of people are already pretty peaceful. Exactly. Cool. And um, someone can go next. Go ahead and hop right in. Hi, it's Heather. Can you hear me? Yeah, thanks, Heather. Okay, great. Um, so I'm Heather Lindemann. I am owner or co-owner of Mudra Yoga Studio, and I run all of our marketing for the studio. Um, I've actually been in the marketing world for over 20 years, mostly in public relations and brand building. Um, so I'm just interested to hear what Jack has to say and, and learn more. Great, great. And um, someone else can hop on and introduce themselves and tell us what company you're with. Hi, this is Katie Snubbice. Can you hear me? Yes, thanks, Katie. Hi, I'm from um, a company called James Place Marketing, and I am here on behalf of my client, who is a golf pro and yoga fitness um, instructor. So I'm here to learn some more ideas about how to market her, 
her business. Great, thanks. And I believe, do we have one more person on the call? Is that Brandy? Yes, I'm here, Brandy Kegley. Um, I'm here um, on behalf of Tindicon. We're a local nonprofit that creates a solution-based event. Um, and I take on the sustainability piece and as well as a few other areas for our organization. But for me personally, um, I have been inspired to uh, fulfill my holistic dream. Um, I'm a yoga therapist, and I'm looking to couple in becoming an apothecary. And one thing I've always struggled with is how to ask for money for my services. So I thought this would be a great opportunity. Great. Well, thanks, everyone, for being on the call. And um, we already introduced Jack. Um, Jack, can you tell us a little bit about why you're passionate about marketing and branding? Yeah, for sure, Eric. Thank you. Um, and thanks so much for having me on the call. So actually, you know, when I first came into this, I wasn't, I didn't, when I graduated from college, I had no idea I was going to do anything with marketing. I, uh, I went to Middlebury College in Middlebury, Vermont, and I studied uh, geography and economics primarily and a little bit of religion as well. And so I was mostly interested in sociological aspects of things. I was interested in being kind of an academic. And, um, but over time, that sort of, it got a little bit tiring because I wanted to actually create things. I wanted to actually do things and use a lot of understanding of who people are and what they're interested in and what they're looking for and how they go about getting it. I wanted to actually be a part of the action in that and not just analyzing it. Um, and when I got out into the working world as well, just, uh, trying to figure out where I fit, um, I took my, I had learned how to use Adobe Illustrator actually, um, for a lot of the geography stuff. And, uh, I found that that was a marketable skill. And so as I was looking around trying to figure out my place, I started marketing that and using that. And I, uh, um, Found, I sort of stumbled my way into marketing like that. And once I did, I discovered that it was exactly what I wanted the whole time um, because it gave me an opportunity to, um, to analyze and to engage with people on a very fundamental level, on a level of uh, who are you, what are you interested in, and on a certain level, how can I help? Um, and that's, uh, that's been a big part of what marketing is for me. And when I talk about authentic marketing and branding, it's a little bit of what I think about here. Because so often, you know, I'll run into people who seem to think that marketing is a game of convincing people of things, sometimes even um, people feeling manipulated by the messages that they're receiving. And uh, so a big part of what I love about this business is that I find that it gives me an opportunity to, instead of doing any of that, it's an opportunity to just communicate on a very real level with people and communicate first and foremost in the ways that we often think of with channels like you know, using uh, social media, using emails, using visuals, using advertising. You're communicating with people in all of those ways, but then there's another level on which you're communicating with people, and that has to do with process. That has to do with uh, um, getting all your ducks in a row in all different aspects of your business so that you communicate your principles to them and then they have the opportunity to communicate back to you what's important to them and you have the opportunity to say i resonate with that i'm going down that path or i don't resonate with that somebody else can take that one on mm -hmm. so uh that's a lot of uh of what brought me into this in the first place it was kind of like i stumbled in and then discovered that it was just this really magical place to play great thanks jack um, so I, I just, I'm dying to ask and I'll just leave the discussion here and then we can all jump in with Q&A as we go. Um, but I wanted to talk about marketing as far as um, I find myself doing things when I market my events. So I, I produce Yoga Rocks the Park, Friday Night Yoga Club, do Colorado Yoga events. So I'm doing a lot of marketing in the yoga world. And I find myself using the words and using a lot of the strategies that actually annoy me. Um, like ah. say the best ever. And I'll use these words that are, are just not true. And I know from my yoga principles that, uh, that it's not true. But I've learned from marketing over the years that um, buy now, um, uh, limited time deal, um, just, just all this stuff, um, emailing uh, people, the pushing too hard, um, selling instead of sharing. You know, like, I, and it's just funny to see 
all the mistakes I make. Uh, so I, I was hoping you could speak to that to start us off is, is about um, what's the difference between being a pushy marketer or a salesperson in, in, in maybe a um, service. I, I've, I've learned mm -hmm. to see things more as um, I just read a great book, Wealth Warrior, right? And, and the more you serve, the more that you'll receive for your for yourself and for your company. Um, so, yeah, can you talk about the difference between um, pushy marketing and uh, serving, or, or is that even the context yeah. you put it in? Yeah, no, that, that, that's, that's really great. Um, and in fact, that's one of the first things that I wanted to share with us today. So I think we can go right to it with that. That is a great lead in. Um, I think that where a lot of this stuff comes from, the things that you describe come from, uh, have something to do with, um, have something to do with, you know, you can look at it in a big abstract way and say that it has something to do with sort of a fear or a sense of lack. Um, but I don't necessarily want to put that on anyone if it doesn't resonate with them. But what I do think that it, ha it definitely has to do with is the time scale that you're thinking about. Um, I think about two different kinds of marketing and one is marketing that's designed. Uh, I mean, it's, it's marketing that's, that's, it's where marketing overlaps with sales. And it's this idea of you're trying to push people through this gate and get them to, you know, put their, you know, uh, put their money where their mouth is or something like that and um, make a sale. And uh, so I think that someone who's here on the call was talking about struggling to feel confident in asking for money for their services. So this is kind of the opposite of that. Um, where I think that once, especially once we start a business and we've got bills to pay or we've got obligations or we've got a loan outstanding or something like that, um, it gets to, uh, we often get to this place where it's like, well, I need this money now. I need this to work immediately um, because I've got bills to pay and I've got mouths to feed and so on and so forth or whatever the reasoning may be. Um, so I think that it's very easy to fall into what seems like the most direct way to turn what you're doing into capital. Um, and that actually, so the first question that, um, I get a lot from people is, uh, there aren't enough people signing up. There aren't enough people buying my thing. Um, why is this? What can I do about this? And the answer usually is to do more of usually what they're already doing, which is try to push it. Um, if not enough people are signed up for my event, what do I do? I create more Facebook posts. I send another email. I, uh, I, you know, pound the pavement a little bit more. And um, I found over time, especially with what we've done with Kindness Yoga, that that rarely works. Um, that usually the problem is rarely um, what we think it is at first. And so uh, if I could just lead off with a little bit of a story around that. Um, when I first started with Kindness Yoga, one of the things that I was tasked with dealing with was we had a lot of space in the kindness yoga locations for events and workshops. Um, but we didn't have, I mean, they weren't succeeding very well. Um, and we did, we, we, we had already done our due diligence, you know, we had looked at the actual thing that we were offering. Um, the product was great. You know, we had some really great workshops. Um, it would work, they would work well in the marketplace. It wasn't like they were super saturated. People knew who we were and they knew about the workshops. Um, we were getting that dealt with. Um, the way of purchasing was pretty clear and simple. I mean, those of us who use MindBody Online, which is the, the software package that's often used by yoga studios, know that it has its glitches, but um, it, we weren't doing anything weird there. So that wasn't the issue. And the pricing and the delivery were pretty competitive. You know, we were doing things in a pretty standard way, and yet we weren't succeeding. And... Um, so initially, when I was brought on board, the idea was, okay, well, we need Jack to be on board. We need him to create more posters and make more Facebook posts and tell people how awesome this is. Um, but we were finding that we had done that in the past and it wasn't working. So after doing some brainstorming and some surveying and some experimenting and all that kind of stuff, uh, I came to this idea that what we were missing was actually just um, trust and habit. Those are the two words that I would use. Um, and they're, they're really correlated. They're kind of, they're in many ways the same thing. Um, we needed people to trust us, not just with their money, but also with their time, also with their focus. 
um, and we needed them to want to build these workshops and events into their habit body. Um, and that's the kind of thing that can't be rushed. So I think that oftentimes when people are, are, are using these tech tactics and techniques that actually annoy them, that feel like static and noise to them when they see it in the sphere, they're doing it because they want it to go fast. And that seems like the logical way that you make things go fast. And they've heard a lot of people say, oh, call to actions. Those are, uh, you know, you're supposed to have a call to action. You're supposed to tell people, click here, buy now. You're supposed to do that. Supposedly, statistically, it raises your, your sales. Maybe it does sometimes in the short term. But if your real problem is that you're missing trust and habit, those are things that are developed through building a relationship. And just like, you know, courting someone, um, building a relationship takes time. Well, like so you wouldn't want to, if you were courting a, a new girlfriend or boyfriend, uh, you wouldn't want to blow up their text all the time and say, how about dinner Tuesday at four? No, okay, how about Wednesday at, at, at three? Right. And uh, yeah, you know, it's something, something, something kind of along those lines, um, uh, you know, and you, and you also don't want to, um, you also, you know, if, if you meet somebody, then uh, when after your first date, you don't want to say like, aren't I the best boyfriend ever? I am the best. This is why you should be with me because I am the best. <laughs> you know, just when you think about that, it's a little bit like, okay, crazy person. Not, yeah, that's, that's kind of weird. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think the, the thing about that is that, you know, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe some of us are, are, are just incredibly, incredibly attractive people and have to deal with this all the time. But one <laughs> distinction there, one place where that analogy breaks down is that I don't think that most of us are receiving thousands of solicitations um, to be someone's boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever every single day. And that's a big part of what I think that we're all dealing with in this digital age. Um, is that every single day, I think if you actually tried to count, you wouldn't be able to. The number of people who are calling you to action, all kinds of actions, every single day, um, especially with technology, the barriers have been broken down to um, our ability to market and our ability to try to sell things. You don't even have to have a product. You can sell something. You can just decide, I'm going to sell something. And it's easy now. There are ways that you can find an audience and start harassing them, really. Um, you, anybody can do it. People who don't have skill, people who don't have integrity, and then a lot of people who do. And so what I find is that a lot of the old advice is, uh, you know, has to do with creating call to actions and creating these incredible campaigns and being the best and cutting through by having the strongest pitch, essentially. And over time, I, I've started to really find like, well, if everyone is playing that game now, and it's a, a, a game where there's no barrier to entry anymore, um, people are going to evolve, and they are evolving to develop more and more sophisticated mechanisms for filtering and not paying attention to all the choices that we're forcing them to make on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. Like on some neurological level, every time you get on Facebook, you're having to say no to hundreds of things as you scroll. No, 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 no. Because if you didn't, you wouldn't get any, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to even scroll. Everything would be catching your attention. So um, <clears throat> I think that the way forward for marketing and branding oftentimes has to do with getting beyond the idea that we're trying to sell something completely. Um, well, no, not completely. I shouldn't say that. But getting a little bit further beyond the idea of we're trying to sell a product and into the idea of we're trying to develop trust and habit with individuals so that over time they start to regard us as one of the few beings that they can say yes to knowing that that one yes that they say to you is going to help them create their world and create the boundaries around their world. Um, because right now, if, if you don't have a mechanism for doing that, there are so many options and so many opportunities around there without strong boundaries and without a way of making a few simple decisions for yourself that allow like the rest of your life to fall into place, you're overwhelmed constantly and you have no control. So that's a big part of what I think is important. Um, and that's, uh, that's what we did there with, um, with the kindness yoga stuff. You know, at first everyone was saying, Oh, okay. So you need to do more 
posts. You need to share what you're doing more. You need to tell everyone that it's better. You need to convince them, convince them, convince them. And uh, I just thought, you know what? People are tired of promises. I'm tired of promises. I'm tired of pitches. I'm tired of being called to action. Um, I don't want someone to ask me I, or I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't want someone to ask me, trust me. Will you please trust me? Please trust me. I'm doing, I'm, I have a great product. I'm trying to do something wonderful for you. Trust me. This will change your life. Trust me. I don't want people to ask me to trust them. I want someone who demonstrates trust and doesn't even ask me to trust them. They just show up and do great work so that I can say that boat, that's the one that, or, you know, that's, that's who I'm going to follow. That's who is going to help me make my decisions because decision-making in this age, it's too complicated. It's too hard. I need it to be simpler. How can I, and so how can we do that? How can we do such good work that it speaks for itself and make our marketing and branding just projecting out that fact so that the people who resonate with that fact say, I am, you know, I'm, I'm, that's, that's the direction I'm going. Wherever that person's going, that's where I'm going. Um, so what did we do? on that front. We, um, the very first thing that we did actually with these workshops is we simplified them and we standardized them. <clears throat> it used to be that it was kind of the presenter would decide all of that, what the schedule would be, what the price would be and all that kind of stuff. And um, I said, nope, we're going to do this. There are going to be three different kinds of workshops. And we've loosened that up since then a little bit. But um, at first it was very important. We created three different formats and if you wanted to present a workshop, you had to fit into that format. Not because the format itself mattered, but because having formats mattered. We wanted to create that consistency so that people started to learn what it was that we did and get comfortable and confident with that. Um, we made our prices more uniform. Even if that meant sometimes the prices went up, that was a really interesting thing we found, is that sometimes we raised prices and uh, we got better enrollment. Um, not because, you know, people will often say, oh, if you raise your prices, people perceive things as more valuable. And I think that that could sometimes have something to do with it. <clears throat> excuse me. But, um, excuse me again. <coughs> that did sometimes have something to do with it. But more than that, I think that we made our prices make sense to people. And that making sense so that there wasn't ever a question within this world where there are too many questions and too many things being thrust, thrust at you, the simpler and the easier and the more sensical it seemed to people, the better things seemed to go. Um, and so creating that consistency was key. We also got rid of early bird pricing. We stopped letting people sign up for a discount in advance um, because that in and of itself, it always creates this vibe of act fast by now. And we wanted to get rid of that vibe. We wanted to make it more like, um, hey, you know, if you're a member or if you're a teacher here or something like that, we want you to take this. And we don't care if you sign up early or you sign up a day in advance. We want you in because we want to offer this to you. We want to give you this discount and you can take advantage of it any time. And so we gave those folks 20% off instead of and completely got rid of early bird stuff because then we had different dates to deal with and then we had to deal with um, telling people buy now. Don't buy now. Just like the idea of our workshops and events, Stops, we stopped selling the individual workshops and events and started selling people on the basic idea that workshops and events at Kindness were a great thing for them to look at. Does that make sense? Yeah, completely. Uh, what I keep hearing is, is per perhaps we're all overwhelmed and there's, there's lots of so many opportunities um, in, in every in every field, but in yoga right now, it's, it's endless what you could do. Right. So how do you stand out? And it sounds to me like we're developing relationship here, doesn't it? It, it definitely seems to carry over to the kind of um, relationship that I would like to be in is, is one that's consistent and um, steady and trustworthy and, and um, no tricks and gimmicks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This and is it has boundaries. Yeah. And it has boundaries. Boundaries are really, really important there. Um, <clears throat> And that has to do with, you know, I'll often, I think sometimes when I say it and I don't explain it, I'll often say it in conversations and business meetings and things like that. And people will be like, huh? you know, especially in the yoga world where there's a little bit of sort of, we have this, uh, this lingo that we use. Um, <coughs> I'm very sorry. Sorry. Um, 
we'll have this lingo that we use. And so I'll say something in a meeting like, um, well, we have to train the customers. And people will be like, whoa, <laughs> you just stepped outside of our little, our little yoga speak bubble there. But I actually think it's a really positive thing. And, and what it is, is um, you're setting boundaries over time. You know, you're being trustworthy and consistent. And you're also being extremely clear about who you are, who you're not, what you're trying to do. Um, <clears throat> so that um, basically over time, you and your audience become perfectly clear on what the state of the relationship is. Um, it becomes extremely obvious and that frees everybody up to be more themselves in the relationship and never have that feeling of being a victim. Because I think just like in, you know, a romantic relationship, it's very easy, I think, for customers. And, you know, maybe somebody on the call resonates with this. Um, I've certainly done this. Um, when I know that there's a problem with my CenturyLink or my Comcast or whatever, but I also know that it's such a pain in the ass to talk with them that I don't want to get on the phone, even though I know that I need to solve the problem. And so I, for days sometimes, will just kind of stew in it and be angry at Comcast or CenturyLink. And I haven't actually done what I know I need to do to fix the problem because I have this listening of them. I have this idea that it's just going to be too hard because I don't ever truly understand the rhyme or the reason behind how they operate. And um, I think that by setting extreme, by being very focused and very direct and setting very clear boundaries through your marketing and through your operations, um, you can make it so that people never get into that mentality where they're actually resenting you a little bit as a company. Um, and instead, they're feeling very empowered about understanding what they can ask and get and what they can ask and not get. And having that be consistent. I think really is a positive part of that relationship as well. Mm -hmm. Jeff, I've been wanting to ask, I, I think we're all of us on this call and people who will watch, watch this, um, you know, it, it's say, you know, you have to pay the bills. You got to sell that next workshop. You got to sell more product. Mm -hmm. uh, when we're tempted to just do another email <coughs> post or another social post mm -hmm. um, or, or just bug our, bug our, our network because we have the short term need of trying to sell more product or fill the next workshop. Um, what instead should we be doing? Um, what, what's broken? You know, what, what, yeah. why are we having to react in that, in that emergency place? So what are some long-term strategies, um, you know, so that we don't have to be so reactive next time at the last minute to pack that workshop? Well, yeah, I mean, I think a big part of it has to do with um, planning and uh, iterating and scaling your expectations appropriately. Um, so one of the things that I really like to do is um, I'm very, I'm on an internal level when I plan things on the business end of things, I plan very conservatively. So um, when there's an event, um, I usually, I'm, and the thing that's planning conservatively can get complicated because if there's an event, then I plan assuming that several worst case scenarios could go wrong. I plan assuming that there will not be very many people there. At the same time, I also plan something for if there are way too many people there and I get to deal with things on, uh, you know, I have to deal with things on that level as well. And so I'm always thinking about, okay, so what's the worst thing that could happen? But I'm not projecting that out and I'm not letting it obviously define the way that I'm doing things at all. Um, I'm instead making sure that all of those pieces are in place so that, um, each individual event or each individual product is not actually something that I'm too concerned about. Each individual one is part of a portfolio or part of an overall uh, pattern or trajectory that I want to create. And it's almost like if you look at a trend line on a graph and you, know, you see there are thousands of different points and they go up and down and up and down and up and down if you think like about the stereotypical way that people think about the stock market working. But you're looking at the trend line you're not being like, oh, well, you know, unless you're one of those crazy day traders, um, you're not looking at, oh my goodness, it dropped 14 points today. And then, you know, but if you look back day by day, it goes up and down and up and down and up and down. No, most of us are looking at the trend line over whatever our timescale is, months, years. 
And so if you think, instead of thinking about that in terms of time, you think about that in terms of the overall business objective you're trying to achieve. Like I was trying to build up events and, uh, events and workshops. So each individual event and workshop, I had to build into my business model that it was not actually about making each workshop successful. It's about making the whole successful. And that's even something that you can extrapolate out to think about your community. You know, if you're a part of the yoga community and you truly want to help the city see more yoga and have yoga be more effective, then you can start to think about, well, you know, obviously you need to pay your bills as a yoga studio and everything. Um, and that's a really important part of things. But can you think about all of the different businesses in town that are serving that same mission Think about them as points on the graph and are there ways to make the overall, the amalgamation of all of those be on a trend line that's heading upwards as opposed to thinking about yourself as just that one point and each other business is just that one point. Can you look at the trend? So actionably, what does that look like? It looks like a lot of planning um, and it looks like thinking about things on a broader scale. And I find that just by starting to think about things like that, some specific ideas come into play. Um, with our events and workshops, one of the things that we did, and it was really hard, I got to say this, uh, it was very frustrating at first. Um, we started advertising our workshops less. That was the first thing that we did. Um, when I saw, okay, so the issue here is that people don't trust us enough and they don't have, our, they don't have these habits built enough, um, we stopped doing Facebook posts entirely about our workshops for about two months and we slowly added them back in once we felt like we were building our audience appropriately. We stopped advertising them. Um, and that just, you know, that, that seems pretty surprising. But what I really wanted to do is I, start, I stopped thinking about having success with individual workshops and started thinking about having success with the overall strategy of um, I guess, I guess actually what I would say, and I, I'm, I'm sort of coming to this right now, I started thinking about it as though people had already given me something valuable because they had given me their email address and they were going to give me their time to look at what I sent. And so I started thinking about myself almost as if I were, um, and again, to think about investment, people had already invested in me. They had given me their money almost like, you know, I was, I was managing their investment. And I had to take care of that. And that was my job. That was my duty. Or I was a doctor. You know, people were going to trust me because I was the expert. It was my job to curate and make sure that I did not take advantage of um, their trust in giving me their attention, their eyeballs. And if I said, buy now, or um, spoken absolutes. So that's a really good thing, I think, to say for the other people on the call is that uh, I, I really go against the idea that in marketing, you want to offer absolutes. This is the best. I don't like it when people say that. Um, yeah, any of those kinds of things that are not verifiable or that our opinions being presented more as facts. Um, I try to shy away from those because it's this idea that um, you're not setting expectations that can ever be met appropriately. And what I really wanted from people is I wanted to stop thinking about trying to sell them the workshop, start thinking about building that trust that they give me their email, everything that I send them is going to not contribute to a feeling of static or a feeling of noise. It's going to contribute to a feeling of, um, of signal, of something cutting through for them. Uh, so... Yeah, we, um, we, we, we actually, my theory was if, you, if you're trying to get somebody to trust you and then you sell them something too soon or the thing that you try to sell them doesn't live up to whatever expectations have been set, that's when you lose them. Um, at the same time, you don't want to gain their trust in some way that's false. So the whole time that I would reach out to people, it would be very clear, hey, guess what? Kindness Yoga is a business. Um, we have great workshops. We want you to take part in these workshops. Um, but we are not going to uh, use exclamation points or all caps or tell you that this is your last chance. We're not going to do that. Um, what we would do instead oftentimes is we would just do these things without advertising them. Um, and we would, because we planned appropriately, if there were very few people there, 
we would have a situation in place that would make that a great event for a small number of people. If there were a ton of people in place, we would have another plan that would make it a great event for a lot of people, do our best to achieve that. And then afterwards, we would say, we think we had a great event and we would share what somebody thought of it or some pictures that made it look really good so that people seeing it would get a feeling of participation and a feeling of, oh, look, they're doing great things. And they didn't even have to harass me about it. They're just doing great things on their own and I get to participate if I want to, but they're not going to push me or harass me about it. They're just going to tell me that they're doing it. And that's when things started to shift. And we actually found very quickly that even though we were telling people to sign up less, we were making more money. Wow. Um, so it's totally counterintuitive, it sounds like to me, to what you would think. Um, I'd like you to finish a sentence here. Um, you, you started off by saying you stopped advertising for two months. and that, that um, Can you finish that? To stop advertising, start what? What do you start doing when you stop advertising in, in more of a nutshell? I, I came up with start being real, uh, start developing relationship. Um, how would you put it? <clears throat> Stop advertising. Um, well, and I don't want to give this as, uh, as, as gospel. This is just what we did. But uh, if I were to say what we did is we stopped advertising for that period of about two months. And in its place, um, we started giving. We started trying to figure out exactly how we could give away as much value as possible um, without, without damaging ourselves. We started trying to figure out um, exactly how we could serve the, the desires, the actual desires of people without asking them for anything. And people want to be a part of something, you know, they want to, uh, they want somebody to help them make their decisions. They want to, they want somebody to moor themselves to. And so we tried to figure out, okay, well, how can we offer them that? knowing that they're great people who have great potential and possibilities within them, um, what can we stand for and what can we give away um, that's going to help meet those desires, those deep desires that they have so that they say, uh, kindness yoga, um, kindness yoga is that company that we want to moor ourselves to because we know we've seen without them having to just tell us that that's what they're doing all the time. Um, we've seen that that's what they're doing and we want to be a part of that. And we want to be, uh, we want to sign on. We want to be the crew of that ship, wherever they're sailing. That's where we're going. Cool. Thanks, Jack. And uh, we'll, we'll open up to questions in just a sec. Um, actually, let's start with questions now. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to ask you um, something about faith uh, that I keep coming back to. I just read Wealth Warrior, uh, which is mm -hmm. a great book. Um, I, I have a hard time having faith though, that if I continue to just serve and serve and serve, uh, this calls an example. You know, we, we started by charging uh, $25 for it, um, thinking more immediate need, you know, to, to, to justify the time it takes to produce the call, your time and all that. And then, then we decided, um, I want as many people on this call as possible. I, I would just want to offer value. I was just, I'm so inspired by, by the wealth warrior philosophy, like just give, give, give value, value. But what I hear from a lot of yoga people in, in this industry and in wellness industry is, is, um, it doesn't come back to you necessarily. Our, you know, our business is struggling. Um, I am giving, giving, giving and, and providing value and my bank account isn't reflecting that. But in that book, it, it promises you, man, ha it's kind of like have faith, keep, keep that service up and your bank account will be a reflection of how well you're serving the world. Um, so can you speak about, can that, that's my question is, um, you know, how, how do we have faith or is, is it true, Jack? <laughs> that I have, I have very little faith, believe okay. it or not. <laughs> I don't subscribe to that at all. Um, I think that it's true. I think that uh, we have as an industry, um, especially the yoga industry, I would say, um, we've subscribed to that, that idea that you have to have faith or it's all about service um, for a really long time. And what I'm talking about is something different. What I'm talking about is uh, it, it's, it's a very, um, on some level, and again, sometimes people uh, in the, you know, yoga people, when I, they hear me talk in a business meeting, will look at me like, or they'll, they'll say that I'm, I'm, I'm a little cold sometimes because I try to maintain um, this, 
even though I'm looking at things in this way that feels a lot like service and uses some of the same language, there's also a, an element to it where I, I don't actually have much faith that just serving comes back to you. I think that that's something that's been peddled to us, frankly. I think that instead, um, what we need to do and the way that we need to think about things are how is serving going to create something for you? Um, I think that those things can go together, but that doesn't mean that just by serving, you get what you need. Um, I think that it has to be something deeper than that. So let me think about this for a second. How do I want to explain this? Um, I hear a lot of people, business professionals and things like that say, focus on your customers more than you focus on yourself. And sometimes that's in a large scale, sometimes that's in a small scale. So one way that that's oftentimes implemented is um, when you're writing an email, uh, make sure that you talk about the customer and their wants and needs more than you're talking about yourself. Don't say, we're having this event or this is our product. Don't tell them about the product. Tell them about what their needs are and what they're going to get out of it. Um, so that's one way that it's often thought about. And I think that if that's used without understanding why it works and how it works, then it, it, doesn't, it doesn't do what it needs to do. If you say, buy my thing, because it'll benefit you in X, Y, Z ways, you're still just talking about yourself. You're just justifying it. You've just gotten a little bit cagier. And by the same token, in this industry, if you say, um, if you say, oh, um, I just want to offer this as service, then it seems like you're giving something to them. But really what it is, is you're not figuring out, you're not confronting this thing for yourself of, of getting what you need out of it. So for me, when I don't advertise something or when I try to create as much value and give it away for free as possible, I'm not charging people money. Instead, what I'm doing is in a very, uh, in a way that I intend to do, what I'm getting out of giving something away for no money is I'm, in sh I'm trying to make sure that I'm getting their trust, that I'm getting um, their buy-in, um, and that I'm getting their, the, their uh, almost a promissory note of attention in the future. And of course, nobody ever really promises that. But uh, if, you, if you're giving away things properly, then that's what you will get. You have to do it in a very, very, you know, you have to build up the way that you do that carefully. Um, and I don't think that there's one formula for it. Does that, does that kind of answer your question? Don't just give stuff away, uh, you know, be in service, but be in service in such a real way um, that you're not just trying to justify what it is that you want. You're actually saying, well, the fundamental thing behind my business is I believe that I'm going to be able to sell things that are really valuable and people are going to want to support me um, if I'm truly, truly, truly creating something that everybody wants, creating something that this group of people want. And how do I do that? Well, I need to make their lives easier. I need to make their lives better. I can't just say, buy my thing because it'll make your life better. I need to make their lives better and then they're going to want to buy something from me. So I have to have both of those things in place. Fantastic. Oftentimes, <laughs> oftentimes I think, this is, this is just me and I'll, I'll just be frank. I see so many yoga teachers out there <clears throat> who are not valuing their work, who are not, um, not really out there sort of, you know, well, uh, knocking on doors and everything in a way that feels like they're getting what they want out of it. And um, even though they're giving away their work for too little in return, it doesn't actually feel like they're serving people. Have you ever noticed that? Isn't that weird? You notice people giving away stuff for free, but then you still, you look at their presence and you feel their energy and it still doesn't feel like they're in service. I don't know, maybe I'm just a skeptic, but I see that all the time. And so I feel like those things are not correlated at all. Yeah, I, yeah, we we gotta honor our the service we're bringing, and I think not be afraid to ask for um, compensation. And like you said, I think broadening the conversation 
um, to much broader than money. It, it's it's when, when you when you engage with someone and it, it just because something is by donation like this call or free, um, I want to develop this relationship with people. And I know how it worked with kindness too is is um, I did some some more affordable events and things like that. I fell in love with you guys, uh, some of your teachers, um, just the feeling of your brand, how you didn't, don't harass me. I get like one email a month. It's, it's really actually kind of sweet and I always open it. Um, but I found myself on a rafting trip with with Patrick, the founder of Kindness Yoga and and um, spending a few thousand dollars on that. And, and I um, it was interesting to see if I look back at the trajectory of my relationship with kindness, it might've been a, a five year kind of thing. And, and it, so at, at one point I gave you my email and, and then I gave you my time and then I, then I came in and, and we started to develop this, this mutual trust and, and I started to feel like, wow, every time I do give a dollar or give my time, um, I get more than that in value until the point when I, um, I, 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 I've seen it described as a funnel where you, you just, you just kind of get deeper and deeper in, in with a good, a good organization or a good brand. And everybody's, everybody's trajectory through that funnel, if that's the way that you want to think about it, is different. Um, you know, there is even, especially now with media and social media, there is, this is a really good example. So, you know, I teach classes there and, you know, people will talk about this as being influencers. Now, there is, uh, there's a particular person who came to my class once and did a donation-based drop-in for $5. Since then, this person has been responsible for sending, I would say, over 10 students to my class who are now all members of Kindness Yoga. So really what it is is like that person um, paid $5, went once, and, uh, in doing that became uh, sort of went deeper and deeper and deeper into the, or hold on one second. <laughs> okay. So, but I am leaving right now. Got it. Close the door. Okay. Yeah, we'll do. Um, sorry about that. So yeah, yeah. So this is a person where um, what's the value of that individual? Is it $5? those other people wouldn't have come to my class if it weren't for that person. So what is the value of that person really? And you can never tell. You don't know. You're not necessarily, you may try to bring people through a funnel from, oh, get their email, start to get them coming to class. Maybe they do a teacher training down the line. You can sort of have a linear funnel, but you never know the trajectory that people are going to take through it. And creating uh, the conditions where people get to participate is really, really important. Um, so that's actually something I wanted to go uh, to something that, uh, that Darren said that he's interested in with his office yoga business. Um, that's a different kind of a market entirely, but I think that one of the things that he might be interested in really trying to figure out how he can do is he needs to create advocates within everywhere that he goes. So he can't do all that work himself. He, uh, what I would recommend and what I've found really works um, in a lot of contexts is he needs people and he needs to figure out who he can get to buy in again by delivering so much more value. You know, someone gives him 15 minutes of their time, then he needs to deliver an inspiration to them. that's going to make them walk out of there and say, I want to be the spearhead of bringing this to the people at my company so that he doesn't have to, so that he doesn't have to push them. I've heard it called create raving fans as well. Uh, but we, we have, we have about 10 minutes left on the call. Yeah, yeah. I want to open it up to questions at this point. Um, so um, anyone who has a question, just unmute and, and jump right in there, please. I'm okay with an uncomfortable silence until someone jumps in. <laughs> and just remember to unmute um, before you jump in there. Hi, Jack. Eric, this is Darren. Hey, Darren. Um, thanks for, yeah, shouting out that part about office yoga. This is really great information, Jack, and I'm sorry that this isn't a full question, just um, great call. You know, I almost try not to be myself when I sell and market, and it's kind of painful for me, and 
I almost can see my students a little pained when I'm telling them about something. When you talked about that first date, make it a courtship, not a harassment. I thought that was great. I even thought of Donald Trump, you know, I'm the best. You know, we even had a slogan, best date ever for our lovers yoga. And I think we're going to drop it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> anyways, I feel like you've kind of guided me back to the place I want to be. And that's that I love what I do and to offer that service to people and find those advocates rather than sort of kind of grin and bearing, you know, sending out Facebook posts and emails and trying to push people into my workshop so I can fill it up. I really like this broader scale, you know, just to, you know, just share with people, our brands, our classes and step out of this, pushiness that I hate in other people and I squinch you know when I do it myself mm. um, so I really love just going back I like with this office yoga to find my advocates and I have so many that I can reach out to um, that's a great plan thank you for sure thank you and one thing I want to stress here is that when we get back to you know, okay, so this is what I love. This is what's important to us. Sometimes it can feel like it doesn't really address that. Well, I've still got to pay the bills kind of a thing. Um, and will it really work? Will I really, you know, can I have the faith as Eric talked about that if I just focus on what I love and on sharing it, that the money will come in. And like I said, you know, you can't necessarily just have that faith and assume that just sharing does it. You have to share in a very canny sort of a way. Um, and I think that a big part of that is, um, sometimes it's means that you just have to take that step back and look at, um, look at your overhead and look at uh, all the ways that you can plan in advance so that if at first something doesn't work, that wasn't the only thing that you were banking on because that's, that's just the thing. Like when we stopped advertising events, um, one of the real worries was that we were going to have to cancel some of them. Um, and each individual one, when on the rare occasion that we did have to cancel, we had to really get comfortable with each individual. One of these can't be a be all end all. Each individual, one of these has to almost not matter. And so you, we had to get really, really clear on what does that mean? And um, how can we, how can we get comfortable with that? How can we make sure that that also doesn't negatively impact our brand? Great, thanks, Jack. We have time for one or two more questions. Um, someone else want to jump in, or Darren, did you need to wrap that up? Or, well, I think one special thing is I've kind of circled all the way back to my burning desire that I want to share my offerings, mm -hmm. and from that place, I'm motivated to make calls and just talk to people from that place where I love what I do rather than sort of try and exercise my, myself and just put on a sales hat and grimace through it. Yeah. You know, the other day, <clears throat> I was talking with a yoga teacher. And because, uh, I mean, that happens quite a bit, actually. <laughs> um, I was talking with a yoga teacher who was uh, saying, I, I need to find my audience. I need to find my audience. And uh, what I said is, you actually don't need to find your audience. You really don't. You need to grow your audience. Uh, your audience right now does not exist. It's not like they're there waiting for you to discover them. They do not exist. You need to create that audience. You need to grow them right up out of the dirt. And the way that you do that is exactly what you're saying, I think, Darren. And it's, it's, it's sharing your passion but there's a very cagey and charismatic way to do it. Um, and I find that what that is, is it, it's, it's, it's getting people really on board and excited about it. Um, and some, oftentimes seeing your excitement will create that in them. But then there's also this, um, this greater way of doing it where, you know, I, I think I said at some point earlier in the call, it's like imagining your business as a ship and it's setting sail no matter what. And it's setting sail on a really crazy, cool adventure. And uh, people get to sign up to be the crew. 
and they get to. That's just it. You're not telling them that they should, but they get to. And if you can create that vibe where um, every time someone has an interaction with you, you are framing that conversation and telling them like, you know why I think this is really cool? Because uh, it's, you know, we're learning about connection. And uh, through learning about connection in this way, um, we're discovering all kinds of new ways of being that help, that are going to help us in this way and this way and this way. And that's something that I believe in so much. And I've seen it impact everything in my life. Um, and if you can get back to framing your conversations in that way, in such a way that it really impacts those people, then all of a sudden they're like, you didn't even tell me I could sign up, but I want to sign up. And, uh, and, and that's where I think we have to get to, you know, it's like Apple, you know, Apple does advertise, but oftentimes an Apple advertisement is a picture of their beautiful device and not much else. Maybe some catchy slogan, but it's just like a picture, but it's style is so distinct and it projects such a thing to you that people look at it and see it and they go, that's cool. And uh, that's what I think most of the best businesses do. Um, Tesla will talk about um, how, you, you know, Consumer Reports rated their car as the safest freaking thing on the road and things like that because that's something that's verifiable. But that's not the selling point itself, actually, in my opinion. It is evidence for what they're projecting out to people, which is you get to be a part of something freaking incredible when you get on this bandwagon with this car manufacturer. And it doesn't even matter if you buy one because we probably don't have one to sell you for another three years, but we want you to pay attention to every freaking thing we say for the next three years. That's, that's what, that's what they're after. And that's what, and that's what I think we're all after. Great. Thanks, Jack. Um, two minutes left here. Um, if, if anyone has a burning question that Jack can answer in one, one or two minutes, please ask it. I want to respect everyone's time. And if I don't see anyone unmute pretty quick here, um, I have one question for Jack here. Mm -hmm. Okay, it doesn't look like there's any burning questions. Um, so on Your Best Life, on every show, um, I, ask, I ask our guests, uh, um, what are three things that our listeners can do um, in their life today that are very actionable and a very nutshelly kind of, um, you know, for sure. actions? And, and from any part of your life, doesn't have to be as a marketing person, um, what are three things we can do to, to just, um, you know, grow as a person to lead our best life and maybe help our customers have their best life? Uh, thing number one would be, and I combine these two things, there's two things in one, um, breathe and meditate. And uh, so that might mean meditation being like a sitting practice that you do every morning. Um, but I tie it in with breathing because uh, I think that it's just as effective in many ways to, um, as you go about your day in any particular moment, stop, take a big breath and let that breath be, um, your ability to drop into your witness function, to be able to sort of step out of whatever's going on for you and the emotions that you feel and whatever's affecting your heart rate and say, if I were looking at myself as if I were on a movie screen right now or from, you know, 10 feet above my head, what would I see? And uh, I think that that's, that, I mean, it's, it's, it's changed everything in every aspect of my life to just try uh, to do that, to try to do that all the time. Um, two, every time you run into somebody on the street in the checkout line at Whole Foods, your cashier or whatever, um, try to remember, uh, how can I make this interaction something that changes the other person's state? And you won't always remember that. You won't always remember to ask that. But if you can get in the habit of doing that of, or of walking away from every encounter and going, did the way that I interacted with that person um, have an impact on them that's actually changing their state? And then you start, it becomes a fun game that you can play. Um, and it's incredibly effective. You know, sometimes you'll have the best interactions with someone who you barely know. And you get to use that skill, that game that you played. Suddenly it becomes a very valuable tool when you really want it. Um, and then the final thing is uh, that I would do, very, very actionable, is, um, well, I'll come up with two very different kinds of actions that I'll give you that are completely different. 
If you're looking for something that's extremely physical and very gross and not subtle at all, subtle at all that you can do to change your life, um, get rid of chairs in your house. Uh, get rid of your desk. Sit at a coffee table on a yoga block. It's completely changed my posture and my health. Um, but if you're looking for something a little bit more subtle, it's uh, look at your competition and the people that you think are your competition and uh, throw out all of those comparisons because they don't work. Every element of every business is connected. So when you try to copy things from other people, it never works in the way that it works for their business anyway. Great. Thanks, Jack. Um, so breathe and meditate. Um, make every interaction you have uh, change the state of the other person for the positive and uh, get rid of chairs. And then you snuck in <laughs> three yeah. point five there was um, turn competition yeah. into connection. And that's, that's a whole nother topic and a whole nother call. Um, for sure. Yeah. So um, thanks for all that. I, I do want to respect everyone's time. But Jack, uh, where can people ask you more questions and learn more uh, from you? Um, well, my website is, uh, is jackcunio.com, J-A-C-K-C-U-N-E-O.com. And that's primarily for me as a yoga teacher, but there's a contact form there. So people can definitely get in touch with me um, if they have any questions, anything at all that they want to work on, um, even just to bounce some things off of. Uh, but the primary place that I'm most active in terms of communicating back and forth with people is on Facebook. I don't have a professional page. That's another specific business decision that I've made. I actually don't believe that most people who use professional Facebook pages should. Um, so I have a personal Facebook page and it's just Jack Cuneo and uh, my network is Denver. And I can't remember the picture that I have up there now. I think it's a black and white one of me um, peeking out over my foot with my head. <laughs> so you can find me on there and uh, always feel free to send me messages. Great. Thanks, Jack. And, and uh, you guys can catch Jack too. He's going to do opening day of Yoga Rocks at the Park uh, Memorial Day weekend in Denver. And then April 26th, we're doing the Yoga Open um, at the Colorado Convention Center. And I, I understand that something's evolving beautiful there. It's, it's free yoga um, to get all people that are new to yoga um, in, into it um, of all demographics and, and shapes, sizes, and financial backgrounds, which is great. That's the Yoga Open April 26th. And I, I believe, I know kindness is part of it and, and Jack is. Um, but I know what's starting to happen there is, is there, there's going to be a, the business of yoga kind of conversation happening as part of that. And I know that I'm going to moderate a panel and, and we're talking about that later today. So um, I'll, I'll keep everyone informed about that and we'll continue to connect this community. And I think um, stop, stop competing and continue to connect and, and sharing best practices. It's, it's just going to make it uh, better for everyone. So um, thanks for starting this conversation, Jack, and being the first one on your best life business. Thank you, Eric. Had a great time. Thanks so much for being here, everyone. Thank you, everyone.